Okay, welcome back to the final lecture for Comp 2521. So in this lecture, we're just going to go through a review of the course, talk about the final exam, um, and that sort of stuff. But before that, um, I have one announcement to make, which is about an opportunity that is available to you guys, um, which is Run Swift. Um, so Run Swift, so what is Run Swift? Um, it's the UNSW RoboCop Soccer Standard Platform League team. And this team, um, this is, they play RoboCop, right? So they program robots to play soccer um, autonomously. And um, they asked me to advertise this to you guys. Um, so if you're interested in joining, then feel free to apply. Um, but some more details about RunSwift is that they need you to have a solid understanding of data structures and algorithms um, to optimize the behavior of the robots and their decision making. Um, and they're looking for dedicated individuals right, who are motivated to apply their knowledge of data structures and algorithms to AI and robotics. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to apply. Um, you can find their website online. Um, and that's cool. So yeah, run Swift. Okay, so now we'll talk about um, a review of the course and the final exam, which is what you're all interested in right now. So, uh, a review of the course, right? So, what was COMP2521, right? Well, we can contrast that with 1511, right? 1511 was your introduction to programming. Um, the purpose was to get you thinking like a programmer, to get you learning about common programming constructs like if statements, while loops, um, and basic data structures like arrays, linked lists, and stuff like that. Right? So basic stuff to get you thinking like a programmer and solve basic problems. Okay. Now, in contrast, COMP2521 gets you thinking like a computer scientist. So not only are we interested in how to solve the problem, but we're also interested in the efficiency of our solution, about the performance characteristics, like how much time um, the algorithm takes, you know, how much space the program takes, time complexity, space complexity, uh, trade-offs between different approaches, and things like that. Right? And we also covered a lot of new data structures and algorithms. Right? We talked about um, binary search trees, we talked about hash tables, we talked about graphs, we talked about tries, and so on. Right, so we learned about all of these. We also learned a lot of algorithms, like um, sorting algorithms, um, graph algorithms like graph search, uh, you know, Dijkstra's algorithm, Kruskal's algorithm, Prim's algorithm. And we also analyzed these algorithms and talked about their you know, efficiency, their applicability, okay? Cool, so here is what we covered in a nutshell. So a bunch of data structures, which I already mentioned. So trees, graphs, hash tables, heaps, tries. Um, we also talked about how to analyze our data structures and algorithms in terms of time and space complexity. And we looked at a bunch of sorting techniques and searching techniques and also graph algorithms. Okay, and at the end of this course, hopefully you should be able to now implement solutions to a wider range of problems. Um, so, you know, before this course, um, you would have only been able to solve simple problems with arrays and linked lists, but now, you know, you can, you can implement a maze solver, right? How you do that, you use BFS or DFS. Right, so now you can solve a wider range of problems. Um, you can analyze the time complexity of these algorithms, so performance characteristics um, and of data structures as well. And you can also make decisions about which data structures and algorithms to use, um, depending on the problem. Okay, so yeah, so for 
all the main data structures that we covered, like uh, binary search trees, you know, graphs, uh, priority queues, and so on. We talked about how to implement them, um, the main operations on them. So a you know, common uh, set of operations was insert, search, and delete. Right. And we also analyzed their efficiency. OK, so here are all the topics that we went through. So first of all, we talked about recursion. Right, so what is recursion? Recursion is a way of solving problems by solving smaller versions of the same problem. Right, and usually that means when we implement a solution recursively, we use a recursive function, which means which is a function that calls itself. Okay, we also looked at analysis of algorithms quite early on. So we talked about how we can measure the efficiency of our program empirically by timing uh, the, you know, the runtime of our program, the execution time of our program. Uh, we also looked at how to analyze an algorithm theoretically by counting the number of primitive operations or the number of line executions. Right. And we also looked at the notion of time complexity and big O, right. whereby um, you know, constant factors and lower order terms don't really affect the growth rate of the execution time of our program. Right. As long as we know what the highest order term of our runtime is, then we can easily predict how long our program will take right, for a bigger input size if we know how long it takes for a small input size. OK, so after analysis of algorithms, we looked at a bunch of different sorting algorithms. Right? We talked about sorting algorithms early on because it was a nice way to practice our algorithm of time complexity analysis. So first we introduced some properties of sorting algorithms, uh, like their time and space complexity. Um, stability was an important property, and adaptability. Right, then we looked at some elementary sorting algorithms. Uh, so basic sorting algorithms like selection sort, bubble sort, insertion sort, and shell sort. And then we looked at some more interesting sorting algorithms, uh, which are divide and conquer sorting algorithms, uh, like merge sort and quick sort. And then we looked at some, but we, we looked at why um, these comparison-based sorting algorithms, so all of these sorting algorithms, why these sorting algorithms um, must have, so why their worst case is bounded by n log n. Right, so the best worst case you can get for comparison-based sorting algorithms is n log n. And then we looked at an interesting sorting algorithm called radix sort, which doesn't use comparisons. Right? And we saw that this can give you a better, better time complexity um, under specific circumstances. Right. So radix sort. OK, after that, we went on and looked at some ADTs. Right, so we talked about what ADTs were. We covered a few different examples of ADTs, including stacks, queues, and sets. Right. And we saw during our exploration of the different implementations of the set ADT um, that there are um, advantages and disadvantages of using an unordered array versus an ordered array. Right, so the main thing is that an unordered array is inefficient because it requires linear search, right? And an ordered array was efficient because you could use binary search, but it was still inefficient whenever you need to insert or delete something because you need to shift elements up or down, right? So that was the problem with arrays, um, and that led on to our new data structure called trees, which could mitigate uh, both of those problems. Right, so trees um, are an advantage over unordered arrays and ordered arrays because, first of all, the way we search through a tree, or a search tree to be specific, is similar to how binary search works. Right? And also, um, it's a linked data structure. Right? So it uses pointers, uh, which means that no shifting is needed. Okay, so we looked at um, 
different tree properties. So the most important property of a tree is its height, right? Because the height of a tree determines uh, the efficiency of a lot of operations, like inserting, searching, and deleting. Um, then we looked at all of these operations on binary search trees. And then since we saw that a binary search tree can be unbalanced, which leads to a you know, inefficient uh, tree, so inefficient operations like insertion, search and deletion, we looked at different ways to balance a binary search tree. Right? So methods like rotations, which change the structure of a tree, but don't change the order of any values. And also um, methods like partitioning, so you know, making sure that um, there are an even, roughly even number of nodes on the left and right subtrees, um, root insertion, randomized insertion, and so on. Okay, and since these methods don't, um, these methods are either inefficient or they don't guarantee a balanced search tree, like in the case of root insertion, um, then we looked at ABL trees, which is a you know, a special kind of binary search tree that always stays height balanced, right? And with an ABL tree, we can achieve log and insertion, deletion and search, okay? Okay, now after our talk about trees, we went on to look at graphs, which was quite a you know, major topic in the course, spanned quite a bit of time. Um, so we started talking about graphs from scratch, so the terminology, the properties, uh, the different representations of a graph. So the three main representations, remember, are an adjacency matrix, an adjacency list, and an array of edges. So those three. And then we went on to look at graph traversal, um, because if you have a graph, uh, the most common thing you might want to do on a graph is to search it, right? Find if there's a path, find if there's a cycle, you know, whatever. So. We looked at two different graph traversal methods, BFS, which is breadth first search, and DFS, depth first search. So, so try to remember the difference between those. So remember BFS, um, the BFS visits vertices in order of distance from the starting vertex, right? whereas the DFS follows uh, one path as, you know, goes as far down one path as possible, and once it hits a dead end, it backtracks and then repeats the process. All right, so that's DFS. Uh, then we looked at some graph problems, uh, which, could have, well, which could be solved by using BFS or DFS. Uh, for example, cycle checking was a tricky one, uh, connected components, um, and finding Hamiltonian paths and Eulerian paths. Okay, and then uh, we talked about how to uh, implement directed and weighted graphs, right? So there is not much difference in how we represent it in our code. You know, with directed graphs, we don't need to add anything special, uh, but for weighted graphs, we add a weight um, to each edge, right? So then we looked at some algorithms on these types of graphs. Uh, for example, Warshaw's algorithm was an algorithm in order to find the transitive closure. Um, of a directed graph, right? So remember, transitive closure tells us whether a vertex is reachable from another vertex or not. Then we looked at some algorithms on weighted graphs. So Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, which is used to find the shortest path, right, from a starting vertex to every other vertex in the graph. And then we looked at algorithms to find minimum spanning trees, which is, um, which is a set of edges that connects the graph together uh, as cheaply as possible, right? So two uh, simple algorithms to do that are Kroskow's algorithm and Prim's algorithm. Okay, and then in the last bit of the course, uh, we talked about a really cool data structure called hash tables, right? So a hash table is really nice and it allows us to achieve O1 insertion, search, and deletion on average, right? And the way that they work is that they use an array, they use a hash function to tell us, um, given a key, you know, where should we be able to find that item? Um, and then we saw that since that this can cause a collision where 
multiple keys are hashed to the same index. There are different ways of resolving these collisions, right? like separate chaining, linear probing, and double hashing. Okay, and then uh, we had one uh, nice little lecture where we looked at some applications of hash tables, right? So how to solve problems with hash tables, because in the real world, you're not going to be implementing hash tables, you're going to be using them, right? The, la the language that you use will likely already have an implementation of a hash table for you. Okay, and finally last week, we looked at a special ADT called priority queues, right? And we tried different implementations of a priority queue, right? We looked at a unordered array, right? We saw that unordered array gave us very efficient insertion, right? But very slow deletion, right? Because you need to find the item with the highest priority, right? By doing a linear search. Right. We also looked at an ordered array, right? So an ordered array allowed us to delete uh, very efficiently from the priority queue, but it has very slow insertion, right? Because um, every time you insert, you need to shift elements again to ensure that the array remains sorted, right? So, you know, trade-offs between the two kinds of data structures, uh, but then we talked about a special data structure which allows us to achieve efficient insertion and deletion, right, which is heaps. And we looked at a special kind of heap called a binary heap. Okay, and then we talked about a new sorting algorithm called heap sort, which uses heaps. Okay, and finally, last Thursday, we looked at a data structure called tries. Uh, which is an efficient way, uh, efficient data structure that allows us to perform pattern matching on strings, right? So it allows us to search strings efficiently, also allows us to efficiently search for certain patterns uh, in a string. For example, autocomplete, so find all of the words that start with a particular prefix. Okay, and we looked at how to implement that, right? The first kind of implementation was like a node that has an array, a large array of pointers, right, 26 pointers if you're talking about you know, the English alphabet. Um, and we saw that since this uses a lot of memory, we looked at some other methods to kind of you know, reduce the memory usage, but um, the drawbacks of those methods is that they take more time to search. Right? So once again, there's a trade-off between you know, time and display and space. Okay, then we looked at some applications of tries. Okay, and that is pretty much the syllabus of the course. Um, so what is the, um, you know, waiting for each of the assessment tasks? So we had, you know, five main assessments, right? We have labs, quizzes, and the two assignments. And then, of course, there's a final exam. Um, so the labs are 15%, the quizzes are 10%, uh, each of the assignments are 15%, and the final exam is 45%. Okay. And in order to pass, uh, you have to score you know, 50 out of 100 at least um, overall, and then um, you also have to score at least 40% on the final exam. Cool, so now we can talk about the final exam. All right, so the final exam, I've already released some details about it on the course website. Um, so, so if we go over to the course website, there is a link on the sidebar here, exam information, um, that contains uh, most of the information that you need to know about the exam, uh, but I have it on the slides as well. Okay, so here are the main details. So first of all, it's a three hour exam, right, in person. Um, you also have 10 minutes of reading time at the start. Right, so 10 minutes reading time, three hours of working time. It's on Thursday, the 2nd of May. So that is 
about two weeks from now, so two weeks and two days from now. So you've got a bit of time to revise for that. Um, so of course it's invigilated, it's going to be held in the CSE labs, and it's closed book. And what we provide uh, is the code and pseudocode for all the main data structures and algorithms. All right, and also um, there will also be documentation for C standard library functions and also a C quick reference. Okay, so, so I said here that we'll provide the code and pseudocode for the main data structures and algorithms. Um, so on this page, uh, exam information, if you go over to this link, um, you'll be able to see what we actually provide. So, you know, this is just one big long page with all of the code for all the main stuff in the course. Um, so you see, you know, we have the sort, we have binary search, we have the sorting algorithms, uh, we have stacks and queues, we have binary search trees, AVL trees, uh, graphs, you know, different implementations of graphs. Um, we have BFS, you know, DFS, Dijkstra's algorithm, Kruskal's algorithm, Prim's algorithm, hash tables, priority queues, heaps, and tries. All right, so all the main data structures and algorithms. All right, and the slides won't be available. So, you know, all the theory that's in the slides, you do have to study, all right? So, yeah, make sure you do that. Okay, and let's see, more details. So, since there are so many students in this course, we have two sessions um, for the exam. We have morning and afternoon, right? And um, yesterday, I think they already sent out an email where you could select which session you want to do, right? Yeah, so, yeah, I got the email, so I think you would have gotten it too, so, yeah. So check your email. If you haven't, um, you should be able to select, like, if you want to do morning or afternoon. All right. And it's, you know, the form is first come, first serve, so, you know, make sure to select a preference quickly. And um, in week 11, so early next week, you'll get an email with your allocation. Right? So if you're in the morning session, then it'll tell you what room you have to go to in the morning um, and what seat you're in. And if you're in the afternoon session, it'll tell you what room to gather in before you get taken to the labs for the exam. Okay, and if you have a clash, so if you have another exam on the same day as um, the Comp 251 exam, then the exams team will resolve that for you. So you'll be pre-allocated to the session which doesn't clash. Okay, and to prevent you know, the guys from the morning exam communicating with the people from the afternoon exam, um, the morning students can't leave the exam early. Um, so you have to stay there for all three hours. And the afternoon students um, get corralled in a separate room. And, you know, you have to stay there without, you know, your phone. Well, you have to turn your phone off and stuff while the morning session finishes. Okay. And you can't, uh, you can't arrive late if you're in the afternoon session. Okay, some information about exam conditions. So, um, so the main things are that you need to bring your UNSW student ID card. Right, so make sure your ID card is up to date, hasn't expired. Um, if, you, you know, if you check your ID card and it is expired, then you know, there's plenty of time for you to get a new ID card. So please make sure you do that. Um, you can bring a clear water bottle. So water bottle should be you know, transparent, uh, preferably not colored. I don't, I don't know if they let you keep it if it's colored. Um, so just you know, try to bring a clear one. Uh, you can bring clear pencil case or plastic sleeve with pens or pencils. Um, and you can use these to do some working out. Right, so you can't bring your own custom keyboard or mouse or other hardware, you know, you can't bring, you know, you can't use earplugs and stuff. 
Um, you have to place everything else in your bag, uh, like your phone, smartwatch, other electronic devices. Okay. All right. Cool. So about the exam environment. So the exam environment you will get to try out in your labs this week. So every lab, every in-person lab, um, the tutors will set up uh, the exam environment for you to try out. Um, so this is a much more restricted environment uh, where you don't have access to your regular files, you don't have access to the internet. Um, that means you, know, you can't use ChatGPT, unfortunately. Um, so, um, and in this environment, you're given access to these main editors, so gedit, uh, which is a really basic minimal text editor, uh, VS Code as well, and also Vim, you know, if you like using Vim. Um, and you know, you get your basic syntax highlighting with these editors. Um, if you use VS Code, then um, VS Code comes with an extension that provides IntelliSense, so you know, order completion. Yep. Vim extension on VS Code. Um, at the moment, it's not installed, but maybe, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah. So at the moment, it doesn't. So no guarantees. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, but yeah. Okay. And uh, we provide you know, all the standard commands such as make, clang, gdb, valgrind, man for man pages. Um, and there's a calculator app available. Okay. So you're not allowed to use your own calculator, um, but there is a calculator app in the exam environment. Oh, pretty good app, I think. Okay, and as I said before, you can try out the exam environment in the in-person labs this week. All right, so if you wanna try out the exam environment, make sure to attend your lab. Okay, now what's the format of the exam? So it's marked out of 100, um, and there are two sections. So the first section is short answer, which is worth 40 marks. Then we have programming questions, which are worth 60 marks in total. Okay, so yeah. Um, each question is going to have a separate file for you to put your answers in, and it'll be specified in the question. You know. So usually you know, Q1 will be answered in Q1.txt, Q2, question two, answered in q2.txt, and there'll be a separate directory for each of the programming questions, right, which contain a make file, a testing program, and such. Um, and each of those will have one file for you to write your code in. Okay, and to submit your answers, you use the submit command. Um, so, for example, submit q1 will submit question one, and so on. Right, and this is really important. Uh, make sure you submit as you complete each question. Right, don't wait until the end to submit your answers because you won't get extra time at the end to submit. Right, after the time is up, they'll tell you, stop, you know, uh, log out right away. And if you haven't submitted, then you know, that would be pretty sad. So make sure you submit early. Okay. Um, and there's a question in the chat, can we set up Vim? Um, well, you can try out the Vim that we give you, you know, this week, and you can see what is set up for you. Um, it's, you know, I don't think it provides that much setup, so, you know, make sure you're familiar with what is given. Uh, but I think VS Code is fine, right? Most people like using VS Code, right? So, okay. Anyway, short answer questions. Um, so we got theory questions, um, which is the first 40 marks of the exam. So the purpose of this is to test your knowledge, understanding mainly, and maybe critical thinking. Uh, we did go through a couple of proofs um, throughout the course, right? But we don't require you to use any proof methods. Um, so don't need to worry about those. 
And most questions, since we're testing your understanding, they will ask you to explain your answer, right? Most of the questions will. Um, so, you know, make sure to read the question carefully, right? If it says, justify your answer, explain your answer, then you should include an explanation. Okay, so questions will usually have sub-questions, so 1A, 1B, for example. Um, and each question is going to say which file to write your answer in. Okay. Cool. And you know you can see all of this if you try out the exam environments uh, in your lab. Okay. Um, now for the programming questions. So, you know the purpose of these is to test a program uh, problem solving programming ability. Right. So you know got to make sure you can program. Um, each question will ask you to implement one function, right? And the questions will all be formatted the same way. So, you know, you've got to implement this function. What is the function supposed to do? What are some examples? What are the constraints on, you know, what you can do with in your implementation? You know, what are the files given? And how you can test your solution, right? So questions will have examples. Um, they'll provide sample test cases. Um, there will also be an order test script right, that you can run to test all the given cases. Um, and if you pass these test cases that we give you, then it means your solution mostly works. But um, there might be you know, a few edge cases that you'll have to think about yourself and test yourself. Yeah. Um, so there could be time complexity analysis questions, yeah, where we give you some code and ask you to analyze it. Yep, that's possible. Yep. Um, yep. Also, um, just because we give you, you know, certain test cases in the programming questions, um, if you just, you know, hard code your answer, hard code your solution to these test cases, right? For example, if we ask you you know, find the number of, you know, odd values in this linked list. And one test case that we give you starts with the number three and the number of odd values in that list is like five. If your solution goes, you know, if, you know, first value is three, return five, then that's a hard code, right? So you shouldn't do that. Um, make sure to try to solve the problem generally. Um, if you just hard code return values for each test case, then you'll just get zero, right? because you're not solving the problem. Okay, and each question, um, yes, yeah, so I already mentioned this, but each question will have one file to write your solution in. Um, so the file will already be provided, but it will just have a to-do uh, comment, right? So you'll have to fill that in. Uh, the make file will be provided, so you can compile with make. Um, and if a solution requires an ADT, like a cube or stack, um, then we'll provide it. Okay. Cool. Now, what else about programming questions? So, here are the main um, assumptions and constraints. So, you can use helper functions, obviously. Um, you can define your own you know, functions, helper functions, structs, uh, hash divines, enums, if you need them. Okay. And you can use, so, We'll give you some uh, libraries like stdio, stdlib, and so on. You can use any functions provided by these libraries, even though you most likely won't need to. Um, um, you can't use global or static variables. Uh, you, um, so you're allowed to implement your solutions inefficiently um, if there is no constraint on that, right? So. Yeah, within reason though. So, you know, if you implement a solution that is, you know, exponential, then that might actually time out. Um, but if it's inefficient, but not too inefficient, like, you know, n cubed, n to the four, it probably won't time out. So th these are allowed, okay. All right, and the questions might specify additional constraints on your solution, for example, um, Going all the way back to you know lab two, there were 
constraints which said you can't use while loops, for loops, do loops, or go to. Right? So this is to make sure that you use recursion. Right? So if we you know, check your solution and it does contain a while loop, for loop, or do loop, or go to, then you know, your solution will be penalized most likely. OK, there might be constraints on the time complexity. So you know, time complexity must not be worse than on, for example. Um, so, you know, for these kinds of questions, you have to think more carefully, you know, what data structures should I use, you know, in order to solve the problem. Um, and, yeah, if you, you know, if you don't keep to these constraints, then you might be penalized or you could get zero, so make sure to read the question. Okay, and more about program questions. So, um, you know, all the uh, submissions will be order marked right, for the programming questions. Um, all the solutions will also be manually looked at, right, to make sure that you're following the constraints. Um, and also, if you achieve less than 50% for the question, then to give you partial marks as well. Okay, so um, important thing is that even though we don't award marks for style, you know, if your solution doesn't work, then the marker has to be able to understand what your solution does, right? So um, make sure, especially if your program doesn't work, that the style of it is good. Okay, and about partial marking, so if your solution gets less than 50% from the order marking, um, then you might receive partial marks right, for uh, making correct steps toward a solution. Okay, um, but after we give the partial marks, the resulting mark won't be greater than 50%, right? This is to be fair to people who did achieve 50%, right? Um, so if you got you know, 30%, someone else got 50% and doesn't get the chance to get partial marks, uh, you shouldn't be able to get more than them. Um, so that's that. Okay, and partial marks are awarded for code only. All right, so if you have you know pseudo code or English descriptions uh, that uh, well, you need to actually write code in order to get marks. All right, and there's a question in the chat about how many questions in total. Um, so so this is. You know, this depends. So we haven't finalized the exam yet, but the sample exam does have, I think, 12 questions around that. So, you know, you can expect around that much in the uh, final exam as well. You know, could be a bit less, could be a bit more. Okay, so now, um, so if you have um, an ELP, so you're registered with Equitable Learning Services, um, ELS, then you might be given extra time, and this will be handled by the exams team. All right, so you'll automatically be given extra time, don't need to worry about it. Okay, and even though the exam paper will say, you know, three hours working time, if you do, you know, have extra time approved, then you will get extra time for it. Okay. Cool, so information about uh, clashes. So, um, you know, you might have two exams in the same day, and I said earlier that if you do have a clash, then you'll be allocated to the session that doesn't clash. So if you have an afternoon exam, for example, then already, then you'll be allocated to the morning session. Otherwise, if you have a morning exam, you'll be allocated to the afternoon session. Okay, so now for um, you know talking about special consideration, so so the important thing is if you start the exam, right? You're saying that you're well enough, you know, both physically and mentally to finish the exam, right? So you know, if after the exam you, you complete the exam and you say, oh, you know, actually, you know, I wasn't, you know, feeling quite well mentally that day you know, it's, it's too late, right? You can't apply for special consideration and do another exam. So, you know, if you are mentally um, unwell or you're physically unwell, um, you should try and, um, you know, go to the doctor beforehand 
um, so that you can get a medical certificate for it. Right, and then you can apply for special consideration and provide that documentation. All right, so if you're unwell, um, do what I said, you know, don't attend the exam because if you do start the exam, then you have to, you know, you won't be able to take it again. Uh, see a doctor, get a medical certificate, and apply for special consideration. All right, now, if you become unwell during the exam, um, then make sure to raise your hands and talk to a supervisor as soon as you can. Okay, and some information about the supplementary exam. So if you're given special consideration, then you will be offered a supplementary exam. Um, and the supplementary exams will be between the 20th of May and the 24th of May. Okay, and this exam will also be in person. Okay, so scaling. So we always get questions about scaling. So uh, we can't say in advance whether there will be scaling or not uh, because it depends on how well students perform. Right? So it depends on the mark distribution. Um, if the mark distribution is lower than what we expected, then we will scale up. Right? And we never do any downscaling. So we only scale up, never down, or we either or we just don't scale at all. Okay. So to determine if we need scaling, we might look at some work of students who you know, just barely didn't pass. And you know, if these students, we look at their answers and we see that, okay, you know, this student um, shows enough understanding about the course, um, then we, uh, we'll, we might scale them up to a pass. Okay. Right, and finally, um, how do you revise? So you can reread the lecture slides, for example. Um, you know, slides have lots of examples uh, to walk through, uh, lots of explanation in them. Uh, so you know, check them out. Um, make sure to review um, the tutorial questions, lab exercises, quizzes. Um, you know, try to redo them you know, without looking at answers or solutions. Um, on the course website, we also have a bunch of extra lab exercises and practice exercises. Um, so on the uh, tutorials and labs page, um, so down here we have a bunch of you know, extra labs, uh, most of which have been lab exercises in um, previous iterations of the course. Right. And we also have a bunch of practice exercises as well. So, you know, lots of things, lists, practice problems, tree problems, graph problems. Okay, so if you want some extra practice, um, you should try those out. Okay, um, let's see. And also, uh, one thing you could do to get more programming practice is to try and you know read the lecture code try and reproduce it right. so the more practice you do the better you'll do in the programming section okay so that's it for the final exam um, does anyone have any other questions about the final exam yeah Is it possible to submit multiple times? Uh, yes, so you can submit as many times as you want um, during the exam. Um, your last submission is the one that will be marked. Yeah. So you know you can submit Q1 multiple times if you need. Um, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Um, so the uh, more practice tests. More sample tests. Oh, uh, more sample tests. Um, there is only one, so the sample exam. Um, so yeah, also the sample exam is a good way to. 
Um, good way to see the format of the final exam. So, you know, all of these instructions will pretty much be the same. So you, know, you can have a look at those. Um, you get to see what's available, um, and you get to see, you know, the style of the questions. Right? Obviously, the questions won't be the same, um, but you know, you can get a kind of feel for what it's like. Um, and for the programming questions, you get an idea of the kind of format for each question. You know, the format will be the same. Um, and you, know, you can see the kinds of constraints that we give you. And so you can get used to those. All right, so yeah, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so if not, we'll go over to course evaluation. All right, so just like how uh, we are testing, you know, we are assessing you, you guys can assess us via my experience. So the my experience survey is um, accessible from this link, myexperience.unistw.edu.au. So uh, please tell us you know, how we did, what you liked about the course, what you think could be improved. Um, and also make sure to give your tutors feedback as well, right? because um, they would also like to know, you know what they could improve, you know, what you liked about their tutorials so that they can keep doing that. All right, and please try to give specific feedback as well, um, because specific feedback um, is more easy to you know, work on and improve. All right, so yeah, so give specific feedback if you can. Um, so here are some you know, examples of vague feedback. Um, that, so some real examples of vague feedback that we've seen before. So you know, there could be a lot of things that could have been improved, like what things. Um, so you know, more detail, please. Um, some of the topics are difficult to understand. You know, which topics? You know, please, please clarify. Um, you know, some concepts didn't really go in depth and explain the code properly. You know, which concepts? Um, I would have appreciated better visualizations of certain concepts. So you know, which concepts again? Um, so, yeah, please be more specific about your feedback so that we can actually work on them. Uh, because if you, can, if you give some general feedback, then we won't know, you know what, what specifically should be improved. Okay, vague feedback. So here are some examples of you know, feedback that we've gotten throughout the term um, via that you know, feedback form that I keep linking at the end of each lecture. Um, so it's also linked over here on the sidebar, so some feedback about AVL trees, so demonstration different cases, graph problems, um, applications of hash tables, priority queues and heaps, and lectures in general. Right, so good positive feedback. A positive feedback doesn't necessarily need to be specific, right, because it's not saying that there's something that needs to be you know, improved. Uh, but here is some constructive feedback as well. So, you know, would have loved to have seen um, and gone through more examples of code. Um, and here's a specific feedback about shell sort implementation, so that was nice. Um, Diagraph, so Washer's algorithm. Um, so you know these are things that we can actually work on and improve on for next time. Right? So yeah, so give feedback like this. Um, uh, but also, um, since the my experience feedback, we don't actually get to read until after the final results are out. Um, we don't get a lot of time to you know, work on improvements. So if you do have actual specific feedback, um, please, um, if you go to this form and submit it, uh, this feedback is also anonymous, um, that would be also really helpful to us. All right. Yeah, and also only I get to see this feedback. So you know, if you have feedback about you know, your tutor or something, you, know, you can still submit it, and you know I can have a look at it. Um, if it's positive, then I can pass it on as well. So yeah. Cool. So yeah, feedback. So please be specific. So that's what I ask. All right, and there is some incentives, I guess. So um, you know it's. 
hard to figure out an incentive because we can't, we're not allowed to give partial marks, uh, bonus marks. Um, so, you know, 50% response rate. Um, and for every 5% after, we'll reveal the topic and mark of a random exam question. All right, so that means if we hit 50%, we'll release, you know, topic of one question, 55% will release topic and mark of the next question and so on. And okay, and this one, so if we hit 85%, then I will shave my head, um, but that's never gonna happen. <laughs> I'm not gonna hit 85%. I know, you know, some tutors would like to see. What's the, what's the previous year average? Sorry? What's the previous year Okay, last term we achieved, I think, um, like about about sixty percent, I think. And the term before that we got seventy five percent, so you know better. But you know, there's no you know incentive we can give that people care enough about. So I don't know if we get any responses. Yeah, yeah I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so yeah. So that's about course evaluation. So again, please try and give specific feedback if you can. Yeah. All right, and yeah. So this is a pretty short lecture right, because there's no content. Um, but you know, you guys and me have a lot of people to thank. So first of all, our lovely tutors and lab assistants. So we have 30, I think 36 tutors and lab assistants. So quite a big team. Um, and also the forum staff who have been working tirelessly throughout the term. Um, you know, some people even answering the forum at 3 a.m. I saw one last night answering at 3 a.m. So, so, you know, props to them. Um, help session staff who, you know, always seem to go over time and are still happy to help. So, you know, they do a great job as well. And thank you to all of you for engaging with the course and uh, trying your best. All right, and um, good luck. So I think this course is really useful and I hope what you've learned uh, will be useful for your future. And we hope you get the mark that you're aiming for. And finally, that's it. So good luck with the exam and good luck with all your future studies and your future endeavors. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks guys. So, yeah. All right, so I guess that's it. So enjoy your last lab. Make sure to try out the exam environments um, and yeah, say some nice things to your tutor. Yeah. Okay, they'll appreciate it. Okay, so yeah, good luck with the exam. And that's it. Yep. And also one last thing is that there is going to be a consult on Friday um, where you know, if you have any questions about the lecture content, then you can come in. Um, it's on, so the location is on the timetables page. So it's just Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Um, Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Um, in the same room that I always do my consults. So it, it's on... Um, the ground floor of K17, just opposite the elevator. All right. And I'll also schedule some consults next week as well, uh, if you have any questions while you're going through vision. Okay. Yeah, but that's it. Right. All the best for your revision and other exams. <laughs>